All right, we're going to continue our discussion about the parables. So only six slides. The parables aren't difficult to master. We're going to talk about the parable of the sower. The reason you see an and behind each of those is it's one of the parables that Christ explains. He gives us his answer for what the parable means. What we're going to discuss is how that applies to the church and then us as individuals. Mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. Of course, in, in Matthew and Mark, this starts the beginning of a chapter that is all parables, essentially. Because Jesus is into his teaching ministry now, and he's got information that he's going to hand out to those who can hear. We'll discuss that briefly. And then he's got to move on to other things in his ministry. So he's handing out a lot of information to the public at large and to the disciples in private. And he's doing that through parables. And we discussed the why of that last week. So, Matthew 13, 3 through 8. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Now background for, for each of these teachings. Christ has done some miracles in the surrounding area. He's moved back away from uh, society for a little while. And he is in two of the Gospels gathered on a beach on a particular morning, and the crowds gather, as they are now wont to do wherever Christ makes himself visible and available. So he hops in a small boat, gets a little bit offshore, uh, where he can teach more than if they were simply crowding around him and his voice was lost. And then he gives them this parable. Very similar in Mark 4, 3 through 8. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. No significant deviation. Within the allowable standard for, for a second witness. Luke 8, 5 through 8. A farmer went out to sow his seed as he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, Plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And when he said this, he cried out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. The difference in that is in both other versions, the he who has ears, let him hear is in their next verse. It's just part of the chapter and verse changes things. It's not included in the specific sentence that he said in the previous two versions, but it is immediately followed. So again, no significant difference or deviation. What do we know about the parable of the sower? We're in Kansas. How many of us know a farmer? How many of us know of farmers? Right? All of us. We're still within probably, you know, 
three or four people of knowing someone who either has land at some other, someone else farm <coughs> or has a family farm somewhere in their history. And so it would be with these people. And to a larger extent than we do now, every family household farms something. If you've got spices in your house that are not exotic, you know, the general <coughs> spices that we use, mint, sage, thyme, those are probably grown in your house. Hanging baskets are great. You know, pots just set on the windowsill are great. But it's much easier to do a little bit of farming on our own as a community than it is to worry about what's not grown generally in large size. So everyone's familiar with the concept of farming, right? You plow the ground, you scatter the seed once, you plow the ground again. Any of the land in between the rows that you walk upon is packed and the rest is in God's hands to grow. That's how farming works, right? Doesn't always work out great, just ask Laura Ingle Wilder's father. But when it does, you generally have a, have a good year, right? All right, so before we hear why Christ, or what Christ says it means, anyone want to take a stab at it? Get what he means here? Mm -hmm. He's speaking of the kingdom, the church, Christ's church. How about the word? The word? He's not speaking about the church. The church doesn't exist yet. The kingdom. Fair, but, but and I'm, not, I'm not stuck on it. I'm just saying the kingdom has different meanings to different groups and cultures. Because he hasn't yet mentioned the kingdom of God in any of his teachings. He's trying to introduce it, and it's coming later in the chapter. He's specifically talking about what he is saying to people, I think. He's describing the ministry, our ministry and his. Say that last part again. Uh, he's describing the ministry, ours and his. Okay. And maybe it's maybe it's more what's to come. <clears throat> he's preparing them for what he's what's to come and be warned because if this is how you receive it, if you reject it, if you whatever Yeah, he's talking about the world at large in relation to the word that he's trying to share. And those are pretty close to his words on it. So we're going to look at Matthew 13, 18 through 23, Matthew 4, or Mark 4, 14 through 20, and then Luke 8, 11 through 15. This is Christ explaining the parable he's given at a later time to the apostles. And this is what he says it means. So he says... Listen then to the parable of, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of the wealth choke of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So there you go, the word kingdom's in there. So I, I retract. All right, Mark. Sir. I'd just like to point out that not only do they need to understand it, but they need to receive it. Is that in there? Hey, what just happened? <laughs> the one who received. That's right, it wasn't received. Did All I right, miss that? We burned through like the last week's. Let's do Matthew. So. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it. So yeah, he says that. Well, I'm not referring to like 
the last part where it says, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands. I, I've said it with many people that, that like, clearly understand what they need to do, but for whatever reason, they're not willing to give up their family or... Yeah. Well, it's God invades the heart, but not the will. You still have to basically... Right, there's a decision that has to be made, and that's a large part of the discussion we're going to have here in just a few minutes. Because there are two discussions to be had about most parables, I think. The outside one, that involves us and our work. And then the inside one, for how that works for you. And I was just going to, as we, we were reading it in the beginning, I was thinking about our parenting class on Wednesday night. And, and how we often talk about being deliberate with our children. And even this is, a farmer is deliberate about how he Or it has to choke them out. Like I, I make my own soil. I was at, I was definitely born in thorny soil. Yeah. I have choked out all my weeds and I've broken all my rocks and now and I'm good soil. To, yeah, you've got to prune and yeah. clean that area that you're in. Yeah. But you can't survive on it. The one plan is not going to be successful on its so, own. Yeah. Have you ever it's seen in your stalks of corn that grows outside the, the planted ground? What happens to that dude? That's what you're talking well, about. Well, yeah, it's a plant that will not produce because yeah, he dies off. Yeah, it dies. Well, it will mature, but it doesn't produce. Yes. It will be there, but it will be a Yeah, that's spot. a more farmer way to say it. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to it. You, you, say, you have to have the entire stock. You've got to be with the rest of the good crop in order to truly. I need a microphone operator. Go with that. Who wants to carry around a microphone for me? Because you guys are talking, and that's excellent. All right, so we're going to burn through these next two parts then for Christ's explanation, and then we're going to get into this discussion because you're already having it. Uh, but I wanted you to see the consistency of Scripture and how Christ talks about this parable and then use all three of those Gospels uh, to relate it to us and others. So Matthew 4, 14 through 20. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Luke 8, 11 through 15. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while. In the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the 
Seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So we've talked a little bit about the external part of that, uh, which is uh, relates more to what we observe in the world and what our task is <coughs> when it comes to sharing and spreading the gospel and the, and the type of people that you will meet. So in how many of those scenarios does somebody respond to the word and mature in Christ and stay loyal, truthful with him? One, right? Just one. Everyone else falls away. Now, a lot of times that'll be followed up with a little bit of math because there's four items there. They break it up into four. You know, 75% of the people won't. I think that's a little off. I think the number is significantly lower than that. Uh, and nor are each one of those a flat 25%. So I don't think it should su surprise any Christian in the world that when we share the word, more often than not, what's going to happen? It's going to be rejected. Yeah. That's okay. It's smart, but that's okay. That's their choice, right? We've already discussed free will once. They get it. We get it. We all have it. Sometimes it's time and time. And we never know the end of someone's story. Right? Did you have something for you? Well, I had written in my Bible, and you just said it, there was the soil. I had written, there's nothing wrong with the seed. It's the soil that has the problem. Causes the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, there's nothing wrong with the word, right? It's, it's, it's us. We're the problem. How many times in your life do you get to just straight look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem? Because there's an internal part of this. Far too often, Christians don't allow themselves the opportunity to admit where they're at in their relationship with God. We lie to ourselves, I think. We fail, right? In this relationship between us and God, we've fallen up, not down the stairs. But we trip, we stumble, we fall, we pick ourselves up, we ask for forgiveness. We receive God's grace, and we continue to drive on, right, with good intent. So I would postulate for you that at some point in your walk, you may be some or all of those things. And it's okay, but knowing is half the battle. <clears throat> Everybody in the world struggles with the third one, right, the world. The only guys who don't are hermits that live in a cave and they're retreating from it. We're not called to retreat from the world. We're called to be in it and not of it. You've got to be where the people are if you want to spread the word, right? Yelling, yelling the gospel in the shower does nothing for anyone. You know, or, or, or while I'm out in the middle of, of an empty field or in a forest. And being in the world requires a few things, right? We want to eat. You want to have clothes. So you got to work. And then most of the world out there tells you to hoard all your wealth, put it in a nice little dragon pile, lay on it, and do nothing, right? But protect your own. So there's a struggle there all the time, I think. I think it's fair to acknowledge and I think it's fair to admit. Because if you don't face your challenges, if you hide from them, have you ever turned away from being hit? Did that stop the punch? No, it doesn't. And there was probably at some point in your life where you were certainly the first one when you were young, or maybe, maybe the second. Everyone has a decision to make, right? And we come to that decision. Before that decision, before that decision is made, what's the best you can be? <coughs> Somebody who just hears and does nothing? Hear, believe, baptism, forgiveness of sins, Christian? Is that fair enough? 
So how does that work? That's the question for today. I assume that if you're, if you're a Christian with a working knowledge of the Bible and you're actively doing the, the only thing that God has asked you to do, then we're talking to people every day. We're making those small mistakes that are going to be made uh, as we learn how to approach others uh, and talk to them about the Lord. And so we're doing our part as a sower of the seed. I cannot control the receiver. So I do not. Have you ever... Have you ever seen someone react negatively because they're being badgered about Christ? Usually it's a family member. And, and simply because they're not operating at your speed for acceptance. You ought not do that to them. I'll just say that. I understand that sometimes uh, there's a reason patience is a virtue, right? And that, and that so many of the Proverbs and, and Psalms talk about how to acquire the skill and the mindset to be patient with people when they're slower than you would expect or, or, or want. we've been and where things are at politically and morally I mean you could take the you know the seed that just withers up and dies I mean you look at a lot of everybody that caved in during COVID and said we're just going to close the churches and everything else and go you know we're not going to hand it over to God and let him take care of us and we're just going to shudder and give in to everybody you've got that and when things opened up you got everybody that's like yeah and they found the happiest place to go, you know, find the biggest praise band and live music or we're going to watch the 20,000 crazy stampede down in tech, one of those churches or whatever into that second of finding that joy they finds it, how did they, receives it with joy, so they're, oh yeah, we're happy we're in but, you know, didn't really do anything about it we caved in, we made it past the first part and then you've got the thorn, I mean, you look at the transitions that we've had, I mean, you know, just think about since, you know, probably six years ago, you drive by that church at the corner here, um, I mean, it's half, they're half, they're half full because they made a big decision. That, that group decided to change who and what they're allowed to pulpit and who they're supporting with regards to those people's life decisions. And, you know, that's a big part of where that thorny thing is coming in you you look at most churches and even just here in town I mean things have infiltrated and um, you're seeing that and then you've got um, your last group where they you've got a good cohort of believers that are sticking together and holding true to each other and supporting each other in that good soil just you know the modern look of where we are in the last few years you can take that same way um, but I always like these agrarian things, agrarian examples, but it's hard, always hard for us to relate because they're talking about barley, which will sprout on anything, not like with grass seed. You throw grass seed out on the rock, it will never sprout, but barley will. It will sprout and it will grow up a little bit and you'll get greens. And so in our imagination of these things, sometimes it's hard to fully comprehend it without some of that base knowledge or taking it and going, well, let's apply it to something else and go, well, what's the barren? What's the joyful? What's the thorns? And giving it a different connotation of yeah, our current of life's examples. Like yeah, it, it's not, it's not the <laughs> same concept. anymore. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through uh, the, the things that you talked about. You, you went full circle on everything that's in the parable. And so we're going to walk through some of that a little bit. So how many of us know someone who, is, who has fallen away? And I hate that term. I prefer walked away from God. And so I should see almost all of our hands. Um, and there are a lot of ways to describe it. We don't have to get into each one of those. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of ways to do it. 
And, and you're right. I think that the number one gainer of Christians in the world during COVID was the living room couch. And I think they're still there. And, and, and if you've ever fallen into a binge-watching frenzy, then you know that, that a couch is a hard thing to escape. And once it takes over a portion of time in your life, it's loath to give it up. And it takes a little bit of discipline. And so, while I, while I think it's okay for people to get scared, I think that, that your faith requires a little bit of courage and, and, and a little bit of faith. How about a lot of faith? We'll modify that. And a, and a willingness, uh, I hesitate to say this because I don't want people to think that, that I'm, I'm jumping on bandwagons, I'm not. But a little bit of willingness to put yourself in harm's risk for the Lord. Not for anything else. Not for anybody's pet project. Not for anybody's pet ministry. Uh, but for the Lord himself. And so, you're right. You know, where, where do they fall in with that? That another worldliness issue? I mean, I, and, and I know, and, and like you said about our children, I know, I know plenty of, of Christians in the world who have children who have, for whatever reason, hesitated, waited, denied, said no. And then we replace them with People who, I, that's, that's, a, that's poor terminology on my part. I'll, I'll say it differently. Uh, we forget them. But then we seem to be growing the body more with people who have all of the trouble and turmoils in their life uh, that, that people who are desperate for the Lord have always had. Nobody understands the need for the Lord better than someone who is scraping rock bottom. Sir. Don't we think as we start our journey, we all fall into all of those groups? I think so. Along I think so. Path, thorny sides, worries, all of those things. And as we get more toward my age, <coughs> we get down where hopefully it's in good, good soil, and it'll stay. Right, and I think I think that age growing. facilitates the entire process because there comes a time where where we, we finally just. But the point the point rest. of it all I is think. is that there's always hope. All the way along those paths, there's always hope of redemption, of coming back and getting our soil correct. <laughs> Is that a screwy way of saying that? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's apt. It's apt to the parable. I want to tack on to that, though, that, that as long as there's always farmers sowing seed, if we stop sowing seed, it doesn't matter how much somebody corrects their soil. You all your seed so they, you know, <laughs> those who fall away have to do their job, but then we also have to do our job. All right. So, so you just opened up that, that Pandora's box to all, all fling the lid wide. How many of you do sow seeds? I can drop that mic right there. Well, we How many of you do? Maybe that's the hidden part of this parable. Are we talking to people about the Lord? Your job, teaching, I add to the numbers, but they will, don't get discouraged because you're going to have all these three kinds of people when you talk to them. But keep on spreading. Keep on, yeah. It used to make me very mad when people didn't respond immediately and throw themselves in the nearest body of water. And That's right, giving them the perfect version of why they should. I was absolutely convinced of that. And I think the entire time. telling people that there'll be these, keep it. <coughs> That doesn't give you an excuse to quit spreading the gospel. It's your only job. Yes. I tricked you. <clears throat> well, I, I remember, uh, you know, because I didn't work outside the home and stay in the home and feeling, and raising my children, feeling inadequate, not having a degree, being educated, that kind of thing. And um, at one point it finally dawned on me that my family, my children were my ministry. And so I was sowing the seed. When you're a parent, you're sowing the seed beginning with your children first. And then I think then you go outside and, and spread from there. But if you don't take care of your own family, 
right? Who better to practice on right. than a blank slate? Right. Probably the most infuriating thing ever. I, to add on to that, though, I think taking care of your own family and your kids is also taking care of your kids and family within the church, like helping them grow those relationships with yes. other kids at church, their church family, that kind of thing. And, and don't get that twisted. I don't mean that every second of your life has to be spent publicly harassing people to Christ. I've never seen that work. Um, but I do think that we should not shy away from the opportunities that naturally present themselves in our conversations. I'm, I'm running you ragged today. I just, I just wanted to walk over here. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's brotherly love. I appreciate that. <laughs> Just wanted to see him walk across the Thank you, I appreciate the hall you. For, his, for his physical health. <laughs> so, you know, we, we just had some news two, a Thursday ago or so, a little bit over a week ago, that we're closing the facility. And this will all make sense here in a minute. <clears throat> so picture one big conference room in Wilmigo, all of the top leadership in Wilmigo there. We just received the news. There's 13 of us in there. I felt like God put me in this place to get my jab in, if you will. So I made a comment, I, and I said, we were kind of winding up before we went out to the big meeting. And I said, I'm going to make a comment. I don't want to offend anybody, but when you all leave, I'm going to say a prayer in here out loud. Anybody that doesn't want to be here can leave. I know there's at least two non-believers in that 13 people of us. Nobody objected. All of them stayed as I prayed. And it's kind of emotional to me because there was word got around the entire facility. I've had multiple people come up to me and tell me, thank you. Thank you for doing that. People that weren't even there in that room. And <laughs> that's powerful stuff. If I mean, I was saying a prayer and a prayer and a prayer to, to allow God to make me speak up to do this. And I'm so glad and I want to share it with people because I hope it encourages you when you're in that position. It's right there. Take it. Yeah. Nothing makes personal opinion. Nothing makes people more willing and ready and open to the word than trials and tribulations. Sometimes I think that's why we live in a world that's constantly testing <coughs> everything and everyone around us. And so I, I enjoy it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a chaos agent. I'm not going to go on and, and help make any. But I certainly see the advantage to God when it comes to how we operate as people to seek his shelter in a storm. So I don't mind it. I don't mind when the whole world just seems to spin on its axis a little too fast and a little too wobbly. And everything's just kind of going crazy. Um, so yeah, that. That's getting them ready, I think. And, and it may be a little farther down the line that somebody, you or, or others, will get the opportunity to talk to them about Christ because they know there are people out there thinking about them. And isn't that what everyone wants? On a human interaction level? To know that you're enough in somebody else's heart to be thought of? So, yes, I think we have a task. I think that all the parables come with a little bit of responsibility when you understand them. Certainly did for the disciples. Cost all but one of them their lives. And so Christ isn't running around, you know, Israel just saying this stuff. It's not, it's not a TED talk on, on what you could do. He's telling us the way he and the Father explicitly and specifically see the world and our task in it. And he's gonna, we're going we're gonna to see some of that, and we'll point that out in, in the parables as we go forward. When he's trying to shape the hearts and minds, not only of the disciples as he explains these to them and gives them understanding, but the crowds themselves who have heard John and didn't understand that, but John, they understood enough to know that he was preparing the way for a different word so that they could understand that. Any other thoughts on the parable of the sower? 
We're only going to do one a week. Some of them are very short, right? If you don't have thoughts on them, I'll release you into the wild and we'll just socialize. And that's okay too. That's building the ties that bind us and, and helps create a better community that learns how to reinforce itself and support itself, especially in times of trouble. So you mentioned the trials and tribulations if you go to James 1 2. I mean, it says count all trials and tribulations as blessings, and he goes on. If you lack wisdom, ask for it, and several of the other things. I mean, you add that into that, it's like what also makes a good crop that produces that if you always, if you're getting seed from something that has never been tested, it's never going to be, continue to produce on and on and on and have. Have good things. We always you, prepare the ground, don't we? Yes, we you want the ground is prepared, but also that testing of drought and flooding and weeds coming in and being pushed back by by the crop itself. I mean, that's what makes the crop stronger. So there's that part of that too. Is that trial and tribulation does produce strength because if it's never been tested, I think Manhattan is tough ground to to evangelize. There, there, there's just enough wealth to where the majority of this population is incredibly comfortable. And nothing makes Christians weaker than comfort. I'm not saying go out and make life hard for yourself, but I am saying that understand the community we live in and the ground we're trying to work. Yeah, <clears throat> I hope I say this in the right way. Um, I know I said it upstairs back <coughs> a few studies ago, but... Um, I feel like in today's culture, we don't, there's no motivation to talk to our neighbor because we've become so accepting of all ideas. You do you, and it's okay that you do you, and that there's not truth, one truth, and there's not a right way anymore. Everybody's way is the right way. And so why am I going to go talk to someone else because your view is okay? And so we've become so... I don't know, just so accepting of all other viewpoints that we don't, we don't narrow that down any way, in, anymore. The pendulum has swung far of this direction, I guess. Oh, wait a minute. We got one, we got one behind you and then, and then here. Go ahead, sir. I was just going to say real quick, I think any college town is hard to evangelize in. Fair, fair. Because it breeds, and I, I don't want to use this... I have to use this term because it's the one that we commonly have and acknowledge, but it breeds liberalism. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean that in a political sense. I mean that in a dictionary definition of liberalism. You bring up a really good point about Manhattan being, being difficult. Um, I'm running for Kansas House of Representatives in District 51 because I'm really tired of this culture harming our children. And just parents in the room, if you're not aware, Manhattan has hired transgendered lifeguards and they are in the men are in the women's restroom so I wouldn't be sending your children in there if you're doing that but yesterday I was at a campaign event uh, with the Riley County Pu Republican Party and no one seemed to stand up about that no one seemed to really think much about that they were more concerned about budgeting and that's a problem when we allow the culture to truly transform our children it's not okay and they're going to be judged. The, uh, so there's a lot to unpack there, and, and I'm going to refrain from being political about it at all. So the, the lifeguard thing was news to me. Now I don't swim in public pools anyway, so I understand why I'm ignorant of that. Um, but, but I think the, the, the issue has always been whether or not we legislate or educate morals. I'm not sure we can legislate morals. I think it's always failed. But we should be, I absolutely believe we should be educating them. But you also have to stand. Yeah. Yes, we have to stand as Christians, even if that means we die. That's correct. And so there's, uh, yeah, so please don't take that the, the wrong way. There's absolutely no fault in you standing in any House of Representatives and saying, I'm a Christian. And, and, and I don't know that I accept what you're doing right there. And then we're going to vote, and I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to choose. But sometimes just stating our position is enough for others to gather courage and stand with us. And so, and, and you're right, there's probably not enough of that 
anywhere in the world right now because of what Tracy was talking about. By the way, the most important part there was that she's running in District 51. 51. So, vote. is that our? Yeah, vote. Please vote. I don't. I don't. I'll, I don't care who you vote for, but if you consider yourself an American, you better exercise that right of franchise. That's the most political you'll ever hear me get up here. I apologize for it, but I do believe in exercising the right of franchise to vote. I don't care how you vote. I'm not going to ask. I truly don't care. Back to that, if I can figure out a way there. Um, yeah, society's weird. And it's getting weirder. Nothing to be afraid of. Embrace it. I don't mean become part of it. I mean that that, that gives us reason to go out. If that's giving anyone in the world any angst or anxiety, what's that doing for them as, as we have discussed in here toward a readiness and a willingness and a capability to hear and understand the word? I hope it's making them fertile. So... Having had to work in the state offices where, you know, you can't bring up some of that stuff. I mean, those of you that are in the military and sometimes in the corporate world. But to build, like, build off Tracy's thing. The other thing is you can start the conversation be like, did you see that in the news? It's starting that conversation because they, the other person might not want to bring it up either. But it's, you're bringing it up in the way of, have you heard that? Or did you hear about that church down the road that had that deal? I mean, do you know anything about that? Because then you might find out that your neighbor or the person that you work with has exactly the same moral objection, political, all of that, which then builds the ability to then pull the scripture out and then bring up and go, well, this is why I believe it. Why is it that you feel that? Is it just a moral sense or do you have a religious conviction? And build those because, I mean, it's hard to just, you can't, you don't want to, blurt it out and run them off at the very beginning but it's the same way of any of that it allows you to build that communication yeah, so by just at, com conversing yeah, what are those techniques and procedures we're, we're learning as Christians to help feed or introduce a conversation at work I always tell people have a blessed day and I'm going to pray destruction on your soul <laughs> they know I'm a Christian <laughs> because they're making me mad <laughs> you know or I just say have a blessed day but it's a way to introduce my faith into the conversation. They know, they know, they know I believe in God. They may not always think that I represent myself the best way. And I spend a lot of time at work talking to people about how, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean I was gonna pray for God to destroy your soul. I'm just willing to admit fault. So yes, figure that out too. That's a part of our toolkit as a Christian. What are the ways and means, processes, procedures, techniques that we use to do the second thing we're told to do, which draws people to the first, be a light. So it's the shine for Christ, drawing others to us like a moth to a flame, so that when they come, they already have some understanding that we, we approach all people with uh, kindness. Actually, you know, Scripture says... Loving, kindness, and gentleness. That's the quote from Paul when he says, you know, to the Gentiles, I speak Christ only and Christ crucified. With kindness, loving kindness and gentleness. And then you're complete in God's eyes. You've completed the task of, uh, of spreading, scattering the seed. I mean, even to what, to kind of to piggyback on what, well, everybody said, I guess. I have, a, I have the prayer on my fridge that I, I believe Jesus uh, said for the, his disciples. And then I thought it, I would always think of it as my children, that he didn't pray for them to not be in the world, but that, the, that to be protected from the evil one. I may have botched that a little well, that's bit. The, but that's the, that is the part in John in the garden. Yes, yes. Where he thanks the Father for the gift of the disciples tells the Father that I've done my part keeping them safe. I trust them to your soul. You know, that's a bad paragraph. Don't you not to take them out of the world, but to protect them from the evil world. Right, yeah. Yeah, because we're supposed to be in it, but not of it. All right, we're running out of time. 
Any other final comments on the parable of the sower as it relates to us?